Tim Brando, I hope you're doing well. Welcome into the game in Tuscaloosa. Ryan, it's good to be back with you. How are you? Merry Christmas. Hey, Merry Christmas to you. Uh, very fast college football season. Is that just something about me getting older, time just flies? Or is it just time flies when we're having fun? Is that what it is? Well, I think it's a combination of all of the above. Uh, our season is too short. That's why I get the biggest kick out of these uh, these fans that say, oh, we can't add another game for these kids to play. They're, they're, just, they're just students, you know. I'm like, it's already the shortest season in the history of mankind. We're only talking about maybe adding an additional game. It's, it's, it, it goes by way too fast. There is, um, I think, something to the fact that the older we get, the more we appreciate the fact that it's too fast. Uh, it's what makes the, the, the college game great in some respects. But it's also a frustrating uh, point, in my opinion, uh, because we're going to have, what, the next two and a half to three weeks of teams sitting dormant and all these um, uh, award shows taking place, and then they come back and play their most important games of the year after they've collected rust, and 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 I think that's a shame. But but it's the nature of the beast, and we have to work around the calendar to some extent, I guess. Yeah, we had a former player on yesterday. We we're talking about momentum. Uh, of of now, he said, literally, you lose everything. You go bankrupt right now, and then you pick it back up. And he said, it's very hard. I mean, you you take a couple of week break, and he said, you lose that momentum. So if you're playing great or if you're playing bad, you lose it both ways. If you're playing bad, certainly you want to be. Uh, but like a team like Alabama uh, is playing pretty good football as of late, uh, you 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 look at that drifting away, and they'll have to find it pretty quickly against a Chris Peterson's team uh, there in Washington. Players want to play. You know, bottom line, that, that practice is what gets old. Players want to play. They enjoy the idea of going out and competing. And uh, that's what makes so much of the rhetoric among fans and and uh, and loyalists uh, to, to the college game that complain about the idea that uh, forging ahead or adding teams to the playoff would do harm to the student-athlete. I mean, for Christ's sakes, we've got uh, a basketball season underway right now, and you know it, watching uh, Alabama play. They they play through Thanksgiving. They play through Christmas and New Year's. They cross over semesters, go all the way uh, into uh, late March into early April, and nobody complains about that. It's, it's okay for them to be inconvenienced, but, oh, God forbid we ever did that to football. It's, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hear you. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. It's amazing. It really is. Hey, Tim, uh, I know that at some point uh, you've had a chance, and I, I don't have your complete schedule of what you went through, but I know you've run across Washington several times. Uh, let me get your thoughts on Chris Peterson's team there, the Huskies. Really good. Uh, much better defensively than people realize. Their secondary is as uh, good as you know, certainly any team west of the Mississippi. Uh, they really took away. I mean, Sefo Lufau was knocked out of the game early uh, in the – Pac-12 championship, but uh, even with him healthy or, or and Montez that came in for him, they just could not get separation from the Washington uh, secondary. They were suffocating. They're quick, uh, and they're not obviously nearly the same size as Alabama. They'll be severely outweighed when those two teams play, but defensively, that's their that's their strength. That's that's really who they are. Jake Browning is a an elusive quarterback. I think. You know, since the matchup with Chad Kelly um, early in the year, I don't think Alabama will have played a better quarterback than Jake Browning is since the Chad Kelly game uh, of this year. And, and obviously the best quarterback they've played is Deshaun Watson going back to last year's national championship game. But he's very athletic. Uh, he, he has not done well, however, in his biggest games. Uh, he's not played at his highest level. Uh, in in any of the great games that they have uh, that they've had to play this year, and I think that's the reason why he didn't get invited to New York. He, with a with a better showing statistically, might have uh, cracked the top four or five for the Heisman. Uh, clear, I'm, I'm guessing he is a top ten. I don't know, but uh, as a Heisman voter, he did not make my top three. But he's going to be the best quarterback Alabama's faced since Chad Kelly uh, and Ole Miss back in the third week of, of the season. There simply are no quarterbacks uh, that that are that good in the SEC once you get past, uh, at least on the Alabama schedule, once you get past Chad. 
When you look at Alabama, how do you see this team? Is there an area that you're looking at that they could be a little vulnerable? It's still a secondary against a really quality quarterback. Uh, that's the reason why they've run roughshod through the league since the Ole Miss game. And, and again, we, we now know the problems Ole Miss had. Uh, that was exposed uh, shortly after their big win against Georgia when they played at LSU, and they just had nothing left um, other than to have that comeback win against A&M, which you go back and look at how that happened, and it kind of blows you away. That might have been more A&M than, than it was Ole Miss. But uh, Chad, Chad is a very athletic uh, quarterback who can challenge you uh, both in and out of the pocket, uh, also can beat you with his legs a little bit. You've got to have all those requisite tools, I think, uh, at that position, at that mission-critical position, to have a chance, just a chance against Alabama. Um, you know, you, you line up and try to play between the hash marks, which I think would be the case uh, if they were to play Ohio State because J.T. Barrett's not – uh, getting much help from his wide receivers. I, I think Alabama would handle Ohio State without much of a problem. The team that they don't want to play, in my opinion, is the same team they played and beat last year, although he threw for 474 yards, and that's that's Deshaun Watson. Uh, the, the front line and the front seven in general is just so very good. It's taken a lot of heat off of uh, the Alabama secondary and the potential issues that they might have. But that being said, those guys aren't chopped liver. They're, they're really good. Mika Fitzpatrick had a big play uh, in the last game against Florida. But they've still got outstanding talent across the board. The only way you beat Alabama is if you keep them from scoring points in other ways other than their offense. Their special teams and their defense is scoring touchdowns on you in the first half. You're done. You must score early. You must get a lead. And you must have a quarterback that's willing to press the envelope and put um, Alabama's secondary in peril at its pressure points uh, on the edge. And um, the only way to do that is to have a quarterback that can both uh, run it as well as throw it and is tough when he uh, is flush from the pocket. That's really what Deshaun Watson is. It's what Chad Kelly has been. Uh, and, and to me, that's really the only chance that anyone has of beating them this year. We're talking a national sports college football analyst, college comment, a college football commentary, Fox Sports, uh, Tim Brando right now in the game. Uh, Tim, certainly um, Lane Kiffin has been a big topic of conversation. I know you've had some nuggets there on your Twitter account. Uh, what's the latest that you know? And, and maybe even recap uh, some of those nuggets that you talked about yesterday on your Twitter account. Well, it's not much. Uh, my Twitter account is certainly no more... Uh... I'm, I was simply reacting to the reports that were out there from other more credible people that do it for a living. Uh, Bruce Feldman and, and many others have been documenting and chronicling uh, his involvement with um, the Houston job and, and other potential opportunities that may be out there for him. Uh, I do know that um, uh, Tillman Fatita, who's very much involved uh, in the Houston situation, a major donor for that program, is willing to spend a lot of money, uh, but in turn, he wants whoever the head coach will be to be invested, meaning uh, there's going to be a hefty buyout to whatever uh, the contract is for whoever the head coach uh, that is hired will be to come in to take over Tom Herman. Uh, and I think that's the stumbling block uh, for, uh, for Lane and for any other head coach, for that matter, that's looking to go in to be a head coach at a non-Power 5 job. You know, Houston's in a little bit of a difficult situation in that uh, they have the revenue of a Power 5 now. They've got all this humongous medical money coming in from the University of Texas system. Uh, they have, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Tillman Fatita is a very, very heavily involved, um, a financially strong guy that is willing to sort of play the role of, uh, of a mini T. Boone Pickens for the U of H. Uh, and so they, they, they have what it takes to compete with Power 5 teams financially for an outstanding package for a head football coach. But they still, right now, are not in a Power 5 situation. Uh, they were hoping to have that happen while Herman was there. They weren't quite able to pull that off when the Big 12 got through having its charade of of, um, of teams applying for the opportunity to expand the league, and they ultimately chose not to do it. 
So that's the rub. Is um, uh, in a perfect world, would the money be right for for Lane to go and become a head coach there? Yes, it is. But I think that uh, Kiffin wants to be upwardly mobile enough that after some success there, he could be able to get up and get out of there and maybe move further west where a lot of his family is. That's sort of the end game based on everything I've heard about where he is and where he wants to be. Uh, He's got a young family, and he wants to see more of them. So uh, if he's locked in and the buyout is too difficult, then I think maybe Houston's not the right place for him to be. That's that's the latest. Uh, he is not the only candidate. There are several others, including the offensive coordinator at Oklahoma, who I was just with, Lincoln Riley, who works for Bob Stoops. That's another uh, strong candidate. Les Miles is not um, uh, is, is certainly very much involved in that too. Uh, and Les, being 62 years of age, and at a stage in his life where stability uh, is 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 not a factor, his kids are for the most part grown or will be grown soon, Um, a a buyout situation for him would not be as problematic. But I don't need to tell you that there's a difference in the image of the way offense is run under Les than than maybe Lane Kiffin. So Lane, uh, so so Les, if he were to come, would have to acquiesce to bringing in a high-powered offensive coordinator that would have a lot of autonomy to do whatever he wants to do. But, uh, you know, today what happened in Baylor, I think, surprised a lot of people with uh, Rule from Temple taking that job. But I think one of the reasons why Baylor got him was because he represents a complete change, uh, sort of a draining of the Baylor swamp, to borrow a political term <laughs> recently, and and uh, a fresh start for Baylor. Uh, so with that job now filled, then you know, you're only talking about a couple of opportunities here. One would be that one. The other would be Oregon. Uh, for Lane, and from what I understand, uh, the guy in the SEC that is most uh, involved in that job is is McIlwain at Florida, not uh, Lane Kiffin. So we'll see how the coaching carousel shakes out, but that's the information I have, and it's based on a number of uh, contacts that I have in the I-10 corridor with Houston. Tim, uh, what was your reaction to Coach O getting the job there in Baton Rouge? Uh, what, what was I mean? What was your takeaway there? Well, I wasn't surprised at all. I never felt, in fact, I'm on record. Uh, You can look it up in Gridiron Now. Back in September when Chad Scott did a piece with me, I told him it was total pipe dreams for anyone at LSU to believe they had a snowball's chance in hell of getting either Tom Herman or or Jimbo Fisher. It simply was not going to happen. And uh, as it turned out, that's exactly the case. Uh, They probably were used. Uh, in the same way Jimbo and, and Jimmy Sexton used them at the end of last year, and they were unable to pull the trigger because of whatever their political issues were with higher education and the legislature uh, to get Jimbo in, and they wound up staying with less. Same situation here. They were used by the agent for uh, Tom Herman on the very night of the A&M game uh, to leverage him into a position of getting a better gig at Texas. I mean... Uh, Joe Oliva, the athletic director there, uh, has has really not handled either the end of last year or the entire search process this year particularly well at all. Uh, now that being said, uh, I was uh, I was happily shocked uh, to see that the guy I felt would never get the opportunity did, and that is Ed Orgeron. I think Orgeron is going to be successful there, uh, even though he's. He's, his record would indicate otherwise. The jobs that he's done as an interim, both at USC and at LSU, I think that's what you have to focus on, not uh, the dumpster fire that was his first job at Ole Miss. He wasn't prepared uh, for that job at the time that he got it. And I think what he went through at USC, uh, and most notably uh, with, with the LSU situation this past year, has helped prepare him to become a really good CEO uh, head coach and bring in good people. Dave Aranda, uh, who now is, is making just just uh, north of $2 million, and whoever the offensive coordinator will be, who also will be making in excess of $2 million, largely because Orgeron saves them a little money. Instead of having to pay a Jimbo Fisher or a Tom Herman in excess of $5 million, they can get O for in excess of $3 million. 
And they can use that money, and Orgeron, because this is his dream job, has no problem with that, pay those assistants uh, as much or more money than anybody else could possibly consider paying them and get the right people in there. And um, I think if, if, if Kiffin's the guy, then great. If it's not, then you know I think they could pay and, and coerce maybe a Lincoln Riley away from Oklahoma or a Sterling Gilbert, who's done a great job, albeit in a very short span of time, at Texas. Uh, he's going to be obviously looking for work now that uh, Charlie Strong's era has ended in Texas. Sterling did a great job at Tulsa, was a part of the, no, no, uh, the Art Bryles coaching tree. He would be a great find. There's, there's a ton of really good offensive coordinators out there uh, to choose from, whether it's Lane or, or somebody else. I think Ed will get the best possible guy available, and they can be very successful. The talent pool at LSU is second to none. They simply need to get a good quarterback in there. And I think as soon as they know who their coordinator is, that will act as a magnet to bring in the, the great quarterback, whether it's a graduate transfer uh, like, uh, like Zaire at Notre Dame, who's available, or if it's a, a great recruit coming in, they've got a better shot of getting who they want as soon as everyone knows who the OC is going to be. Tim, I've got a two-part question here, and I want to finish up. If we're talking to Tim Brando right now on the game here in Tuscaloosa. Do you think the SEC is down a little bit this year? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I was asked um, just this past week about my thoughts in the summer about Alabama. You know, I thought they'd lose twice. I thought the schedule was very, very difficult for them, having to go to Arkansas, to LSU, and to Ole Miss, uh, and having to play A&M as well. And I just felt like there were just too many uh, critical games on the road uh, for them to, to get through unscathed and I was clearly wrong um, and I think I, com- I, I really overestimated the caliber of competition they were going to be playing uh, I thought Tennessee was going to be a legitimate uh, power team this year I think I'm not alone in that I think a lot of other people felt similarly uh, LSU clearly not making any changes from an offensive standpoint uh, with the understanding that Miles was up against it uh, at the end of last year was a little bit shocking that they were still uh, stubborn enough to continue to try to play power football against Alabama. Um, really was surprising to me. And even even after uh, Orgeron had taken over, they, they just didn't have the flexibility or diversity or collective intellectual wherewithal to, to change what they needed to do. Uh, I think in terms of overall talent, uh, matching up, to be, un- uh, to be uh, tied, nothing, nothing going into the fourth quarter speaks to the kind of talent LSU has, but it is clearly the most um, underused uh, talent that I've seen in years. I mean, for that team to have four losses is pretty shocking. Uh, a couple of those games were just thrown away, really. The Florida game, especially at the end, comes to my mind. But, um, but Alabama is you know, they look invincible, I think, in large measure because the SEC has allowed them to look that way. Uh, there are no quarterbacks in the conference that come close to the quarterbacks I see on a regular basis in the Big 12 and in the Pac-12. Uh, and it's the reason the Big 10 is a better league this year than the SEC. There are better quarterbacks in that league than there are in the Southeastern Conference. Hey. And um, that really comes back to coaching. Uh, that comes right back to leadership and coaching at the other schools. Got to hand it to Nick. You know, he adjusted, adapted uh, by bringing in Lane and uh, and getting the most out of a freshman like Jalen to have done what he did with Jake Coker last year and then Blake Sims the year prior to that. It's pretty amazing stuff. Uh, and while while off the offense of Alabama was improving, offenses around the SEC were not. And we already know how much better the Alabama defense is than everybody else. So therein lies the issue. Uh, is Alabama one of the best teams I've ever seen this year? Yeah. But uh, could my eyes be deceiving me somewhat because the SEC isn't as good as it was three years ago? Absolutely. I said I had a second part question. You just knocked the second one out without me even asking it. That's where I was going. Looking at the yeah. conference, looking at the team, I'm not trying to take away anything from Alabama. This may get me a trip to my local psychiatrist uh, here in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> but, but I mean, I just look at Alabama, and I, I think they've taken advantage of of a lot of teams in the SEC, like an 8-4 and four Auburn, 
There's no mm-hmm. business that team should be in the Sugar Bowl. I mean, I've watched this team several times. They're not a quality football team. They're pretty good on defense. Their offense is a mess. Uh, but, yeah, I think I think Oklahoma's going to blow the doors off. I agree. Uh, Oklahoma play, is playing now at a much higher level. Uh, you've seen how they've evolved uh, over the last, oh, really since the Ohio State loss. You know, teams evolve in the college game. That's one of the reasons why I think we need to go to six teams instead of four because, you know, Penn State was injured early. They had a lot of injuries when they got both raised by Michigan. And you see what happened to them. Uh, they beat Ohio State head-to-head, then won the conference championship. I don't think they, the, the, the playoff committee got it wrong. In fact, I think based on the criteria, they got it right. But they were very fortunate, Ryan, that there were no upsets. Because had there been, then all hell would have broken loose. And we're getting closer. I think it would be really good. Uh, you know, every three years of this contract, there are clauses built in for them to make some changes along the way. And I think now's the time. Don't wait until you get embarrassed and have a 2011 BCS situation with a god-awful rematch like the one we had, which forced really the playoff upon us, that 2011 BCS title game. Don't, don't wait until that happens. Go ahead and be progressive, and let's move ahead to 16. So if you don't want to do eight, I understand that. But let's go to six and allow for more access because, and everybody will say, well... You know, every year is different. Yeah, but, but I'm beginning to see now what everybody else already knows, and that is with scholarship limitations being where they are and the level of athletes that are now uh, uh, available across the country um, to go along with those scholarship limitations, everybody's going to be pretty good. So the level of dynamic or great teams like the ones we see at Alabama, the opportunity to have those kinds of dynasties are few and far between. Let's go ahead and allow for more access to so that these teams that are getting better through the course of the year but maybe lost a couple of games in September still have a chance to be a part of it. You know, we all want to see the best teams playing at the highest level. And if we had six, then I think we would have a much better situation. If we could add Penn State and Michigan to the fray this year, it would make for a much more exciting playoffs, in my opinion. Um, And, and, you know, in, in later years, we could say the same thing about the other two teams that are just on the outside looking in. Um, no one's suggesting that we have to go to six or to eight and then it's 12 and then 16. Nobody's saying that. We're just simply saying let's make it better than it is now. Uh, right now, you know, you can make a real strong case that, um, you know, Alabama's going to blow out Washington uh, and, and uh, Clemson may blow out Ohio State. I mean, they could. Uh, but if we awarded the two top teams with a bye and we let number two play number five and number three play number four, how much fun would be? Oh, it would be a ton. Would... It'd be a ton. I yeah. mean, it would and it would put be... value on the regular season because you'd want it one would. of those buys. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. It would be fantastic. So I hope that's the direction the committee considers going in uh, in the off season. These guys have a lot of time to, to, to discuss it. Um, they know how close they were to Armageddon. Uh, it just they just needed one one upset to take place, and we would have had it. Uh, why not be a little proactive and and uh, allow for more access? It's just gonna make it's gonna make the, the the great sport we love so much even better.